Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. Autoimmune diseases are on the rise today and there are at least 100 different autoimmune diseases and at least 40 other diseases to have uh, that are suspected to have an autoimmune origin. If we include diseases that have an autoimmune basis, autoimmune diseases are the third leading cause of death in the United States, since most of these diseases are chronic and often life-threatening. Some of the more common autoimmune diseases include Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's hypothyroid, celiac disease, Graves, type 1 diabetes, psoriasis, multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, and irritable bowel disease, but most of you probably know this already. The immune system is designed to protect us from bacteria and viruses and parasites, etc., and to repair our tissues when damaged, among other functions. Autoimmune diseases, as most of us know, are diseases where the immune system, instead of attacking pathogens, um, start attacking our own cells and organs. The immune system is out of balance, often referred to as immune dysregulation. While the conventional medical community is often content with simply prescribing an immune blocking or modulating medication to help control symptoms such as Humira or Embrel, as functional medicine practitioners, we want to find out what are some of the root causes and correct these. There are three major categories of triggers for autoimmune diseases. And these are toxins like pesticides, bisphenol A, heavy metals, mycotoxins. We have food sensitivities and we have infections, which are our topic for tonight. And now I would like to invite Heather Nago from Cyrex Labs, who, are spon- who is our sponsor for this evening, to tell us some information about Cyrex Labs. Heather, go ahead and unmute yourself. And- Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much. My name is Heather Ngo, uh, Territory Manager at Cyrex Labs. And um, our lab is based in Arizona, and uh, our focus is autoimmunity. Uh, we do offer barrier testing, evaluating the intestinal and blood-brain barrier integrity, we have environmental trigger testing, identifying reactivity, uh, dietary proteins, chemicals, and heavy metals. We have predictive antibody testing, identifying precursors of autoimmune disorders, um, a panel of cognitive uh, health, identifying early sign of neurocognitive decline. We also have a saliva test evaluating possible outcomes of uh, compromised mucosal tolerance. Uh, We can ship out the serum or saliva kit directly to your patients, um, especially during this crazy time. And we are providing a show special for today. It is a hundred dollars off on our pathogens panel. This panel has uh, 29 markers, consists of viral, bacterial, spirochete, uh, parasite, yeast, and mold. We are assessing just the IgG, the latent pathogens that may lead to multiple autoimmune reactions. And I just want you to know this promotion expires um, March the 15th, uh, 21 of this year. And if you have any questions or would like to schedule a one-on-one education, please call, text, email me to schedule it. Um, I will also provide my contact information via the chat room. And um, thank you so much, Dr. Weitz, um, for having us. And I'm going to pass this invisible mic back to you. (laughs) We are so excited to listen to Dr. Vojdani's presentation. Absolutely, me too. And I promise not to drop the invisible mic. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So um, our speaker for tonight is Dr. Aristo Vojdani, 
who I'm sure most of you already know. He is the father of functional immunology, and he's dedicated his life to helping us figure out what are the triggers for autoimmune diseases. And many of the tests that he has developed for Cyrex Labs are focused on this, including the Array 12, which is the pathogen-associated um, immune reactivity screen that Heather referred to. Um, Dr. Vashtani has a PhD in microbiology and immunology, and he's authored over 200 scientific papers published in peer-reviewed journals. Dr. Vashtani is the co-owner of Immunosciences Lab in Los Angeles, which offers testing for various types of infections, including Lyme disease. He is the chief science advisor for Cyrex Labs, whom he has developed all the testing for. He's also a professor in the Department of Preventative Medicine at Loma Linda University. And I would like you to indulge me for one more minute to tell you an anecdotal story. Um, so I've been putting on these functional medicine meetings for about five years, and uh, we've been honored to have Dr. Vashtani speak almost every year, except for last year. And Usually I get the opportunity to have dinner with Dr. Vashtani about a week or so before we have the meeting. So um, I can find out wh what he's gonna be talking about and I'm in a better position to try to ask some intelligent questions. And usually Dr. Vashtani shows up for dinner with this huge stack of scientific papers that we end up discussing, which is very exciting for a research geek like myself. But the reason I'm telling you this is that if you don't know, any statement that Dr. Vashtani makes is informed by hundreds of scientific research papers. So thank you so much for honoring us with your presence tonight, Dr. Risto Vashtani. Thank you. Go ahead. And so Dr. Vashtani, if questions come up, uh, would you like me to uh, chime in or do you want me to wait till the end? Wait till the end. And then uh, please read the questions for me. Okay, you got it. Okay, thank you so much. So first of all, thank you, Dr. Weitz, for your introduction. Uh, I'm happy to see many of you, many uh, familiar faces. Uh, Heather, uh, Michelle from Cyrex, and many, and in particular, I'm very proud to see my son, Elroy, is one of the uh, doctors who is participating tonight in this Zoom. So I'm going to talk about chronic infections as triggers for autoimmune diseases. And so this is my disclosure already. Uh, Dr. White talked about this, Immunosciences Lab, Cyrex, and Loma Linda University. There is a reason I'm going to start with the immune system tonight. Because honestly, in the past year, almost past year or so, we heard so much about antibody, antibody, antibody. And the antibodies do dis uh, disappear after a month or two months and three months. And after that, we don't have immunity against COVID. Th that's the reason I'm putting this slide to clarify this point. So when we get exposed to a virus such as Corona, SARS-CoV-2, this virus particle is too big for our T cell and B cells. So macrophages, which are part of first line of defense, our innate immunity will taking that up and breaking it to smaller pieces called an antigen. Then they take that antigen, presenting that to antigen presenting cell, presenting that to T helper cells. However, let's stop for a few seconds in here. So what will happen to that virus when macrophages is breaking that to smaller pieces? It's not anymore a virus. So this is the most important part of our defense system, that our macrophages should be able to take that virus and breaking, break that to the pieces and then give that to antigen-presenting cells to the T helper cells. 
This process will take probably a few seconds or a few minutes. So that's the most important part of our immune defenses. Then the antigen presenting cells, presenting that antigen to T helper cells. T helper cells by producing different type of cytokines become cytotoxic lymphocytes. What is the job of cytotoxic lymphocyte? If the macrophages were not able to take care of some of these viruses and break them down to smaller pieces, the cytotoxic lymphocyte will go after any virus particles in our cells, any cells infect, which are infected with that virus and destroy that virus plus the cell which is infected with that virus. This process will take few hours. Also the job of cytotoxic lymphocyte is to kill tumor target cell. So this is our defense also against tumor cells. Now T helper cells in the presence of different type of cytokines become T helper one or T helper two, and then T helper cells communicate with B cells, giving all the information to the B cells about these viral antigens to start to become, to, to divide, to become plasma cells and to start producing antibodies against the viral antigens. Process which takes about 14 days. Why it takes 14 days? Because all this process of putting together the factory that manufactures antibody takes about 14 days. So after 14 days, these plasma cells will produce different isotypes of antibodies. So if in case the phagocytes could not do the job or finish the job, the cytotoxic lymphocyte could not do the job, the antibody will bind to the virus and now complex of antibody plus viruses will be destroyed by our immune cells. Furthermore, I would like to present it here that when T helper cells become activated and present the information to the B cells, another subset of T helper cells, which I don't have it in here, just imagine should be right here, is going to be called memory T cell. And that memory T cell will remember forever that had some kind of reaction to, in this case, SARS-CoV-2, could be Epstein-Barr virus. So remember, that computer called memory T cell is going to stay in the body forever. Is there and any controversy not, about that, or is that absolute, definitely true, no matter what? It is absolutely true, no matter what. Thank you for asking that, okay? There is a reason, again, I put the, this slide in the beginning. So memory, T cells, there are shorter memory T cells, as, as you see the name, may disappear in few months, but there are long-term memory T cells will stay in our body forever. Now, you see in here, I emphasize memory B cells. Also, they are short-term and long-term. The long-term memory B cell will stay in our body forever. So together, memory T cell and memory B cells are going to be in our body. They're waiting for entry of the same virus into our body for second time or the third time. And this time they are not going to wait 14 days to start making antibodies they will start making antibodies within hours and maximum within 24 hours. That was the reason I decided to put this slide 
But why, why do we hear all these public health experts say, well, we don't really know if there's long-term immunity? I'm sorry, they are not public health experts. <laughs> they don't understand immunology. Okay. This is written in a textbook of immunology. Memory T cells and memory B cells stay in our body forever. They are talking about disappearance of antibody. Yes, antibody will disappear in some people after 30 days, in some people after 60 days, in some people after 90 days. Okay? So, so that's why I emphasize here the memory B cell. When second time the same virus get into the body, they are going to react to that and immediately they are going to produce antibodies. So when for the first time our body get exposed to that antigen, in this case, SARS-CoV-2, IgM antibody is going to be produced, followed by IgG. IgM is going to stay in the body for about, let's say, two weeks, maximum three weeks, not longer than four weeks. The IgG will pick up and stay in the body up to three months. Okay, and then we'll go down almost to background level. Now, when the same virus, so imagine that you had your first vaccine, okay? So this is what happened when you had your first vaccine. This, this is your IgM and this is your IgG. Now you are going to get your second vaccine. Look what is going to happen immediately. Your body is going to produce IgM the same level as before, but the IgG is going to be 10 times. This is logarithmic. If this was only, let's say, 50 units, now you are going to produce 500 units of antibody. And because the half-life of IgG is about 21 days, if you made 500 units of IgG, imagine how long that is going to be in your body, probably months or sometimes years. So therefore, this is the principle of uh, vaccination. And if you get the third vaccine or the third antigen, this time this antigen goes all the way up to the roof. So, But does that really matter if we have long-term memory T cells? Do we really want that? Does it help? The memory T cells and memory B cells are going to help immediately to wake up the B cells to start making antibodies. So do we really need this second big spike in IgG? The second spike in IgG is we need, uh, the more antibody, the better virus will be neutralized if the virus will get into our body. Only during the period of time that the IgG- Yes, otherwise the antibody is circulating in blood doing nothing. We need those antibodies only if the virus get into our body. And the, the antibody is going to bind to the receptors or antigens on the virus, neutralizing it and preventing the virus from division and replication. Okay? Okay. All right. Now, viruses have been in the environment for millions of years. This is absolutely true. Actually, I took all of this from uh, an article from Science about two months ago. Scientists estimate that 380 trillion viruses live on or inside the human body. The human virome is 10 times the number of microbiome. Guess what? We always hear about our microbiome. We hear nothing about our virome. Believe me, there are many, many beneficial viruses in our body. Not our viruses are bad. So almost half of all the biological materials within our body is not human, meaning it's bacteria or viruses or fungi or parasites. So what are viruses made up? They are made up pieces of DNA and RNA. They're biological particles. 
they cannot replicate on themselves, on their own. But they do it with the help of the host. That's why they have to infect cells, epithelial cells, nerve cells, heart, or muscle cells. As soon as they get inside the cell, they use whatever material available from that cell and replicate. And from one, they become two, and then four, and uh, thousands and millions. Unfortunately, during this replication, the virus mutate to acquire proteins that share homology. Remember, tonight I'm going to talk a lot about this. With human tissue cells, which they reside. Why they do that? To hide from the immune system. The viruses use this strategy to look like human tissue antigens. In the process, they hide from immune attack. We'll talk more about this later. So what is mimicry or similarity or cross-reactivity? Cross-reactivity refers to the direct competition between two different molecules for the same binding site and an antibody due to structural similarity. And you'll see example here. I published about 10 years ago, published an article about wheat gliadin cross-react with cerebellum. So when our lymphocytes react to wheat gliadin, they make antibodies against gliadin. But because components of gliadin looks, so anti-gliadin binds to gliadin, right? But because components of gliadin partially looks like cerebellum, the same antibody also reacts to cerebellum. We call this cross-reactivity. Let me give you another example because cross-reactivity is not only about IgG, could be about IgE. Imagine that you are allergic to house dust mites. So every time you get exposed to house dust mites, you sneeze and you have type one IgE mediated allergic reaction. But because I'm giving you an example, peanuts, or cat or dog danders also cross-react with house dust mites. So your memory lymphocytes remembering your reaction to house dust mites. Now you get exposed to the dog dander, immediately also you start sneezing. This is cross-reactivity between house dust mites and antigen from dog or cat or food antigen such as peanuts. So the world of cross-reactivity is very vast. So that's why the virus trying to change its structure to look like human cells in order to hide from the immune system but there will be a huge price we are paying for that strategy. And we'll, I will explain that later on. So I did publish an article, but I'll talk about that later. But this article in Frontiers in Immunology it's called about potential, potential cross-reactivity, cross-reactive immunity to SARS-CoV-2 from common human pathogens and vaccines. You heard that if you get vaccinated with polio or with child, other child, with child vaccines or with BCG, you may not get infected 
with SARS-CoV-2. Is this true? Absolutely, yes. So here an article or a slide from an article in Journal of Immunology. They call that off-target revaccination. So imagine, so an individual is having high load of SARS-CoV-2 and having severe inflammation, cytokine storm and all of that, which we know what is the consequences of that. But if we take that person and give him BCG, they call that off-target vaccination. What will happen cause a second reactivation of adaptive immunity and induction of effective secondary hypo inflammatory antiviral immune response. Drastic reduction in CD3 T cell activation, dampening of innate immune hyperactivation, and finally the result of that will be regeneration and recovery of the host health and survival. So that's why giving vaccines other than SARS-CoV-2 to individuals suffering from COVID may help to subvert the immune system from attacking the tissue through this process and save that individual from uh, the virus. There was a question there? Okay. Um, no, we'll, we'll save it to the end. I mean, there's lots of questions that have been coming yes, in. Yes, yes, right? please. Okay, so now back to the world of cross-reactivity. As you know, I published lots of articles about cross-reactivity. One of them in 2018, in Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. What did we do in this case? We took antibodies made against amyloid beta peptide 1 through 42, which is responsible for amyl and, uh, production of amyloid plaque. When we apply that to 30 or 40 different pathogens, we found that amyloid peptide antibody not only reacted with amyloid peptide itself, this is like the 100% reaction, but reacted with oral pathogen. That's why oral pathogens playing a role in Alzheimer's disease. Enterococcus. Bacteria very similar to E. coli in our gut. Candida albicans, Giardia. Borrelia bergdorferi, the agent of Lyme disease. And then some molds such as Aspergillus and Penicillium. So these pathogens, if we make antibody against them, those antibodies can turn against our amyloid beta, causing amyloid beta aggregation. That's the message. Furthermore, that antibody reacted slightly with West Nile virus, HSV1. That's why HSV1, herpes type 1, playing a role in Alzheimer's. EBV, early antigen. Influenza. So I'm not here to answer or say whether or not you should be vaccinated with influenza A and B, okay? Cross reactivity with amyloid beta, rabies, and look at HPV. And again, I'm not here to say get vaccine against HPV or do not get vaccine against HPV. The data is very clear. These viruses and bacteria cross-react with amyloid beta. Some may I argue just, I just that. like to point out to everybody that Cyrex has the Alzheimer's Lynx test, and you can use that to screen patients for all these different 
uh, pathogens and and other um, immuno immunoreactants uh, for uh, preventing Alzheimer's disease. Some thank you, Ben. Some may ex uh, explain this a little bit different, saying like, well, if we vaccinate with HPV, we make antibody against amyloid beta. It's good because they inject monoclonal antibodies against amyloid beta to prevent Alzheimer's disease. Then my question is, did it work? The answer is no. Close to 40 different monoclonal antibodies were tried for Alzheimer's disease prevention and treatment. And based on uh, articles published in the literature, I believe none of them were. So this is the world of cross-reactivity. So you can interpret the results both ways, okay? So that's why I'm showing here the pathogens. And Ben was kind enough to mention what Cyrex is doing and we're very proud uh, with our publications, emphasizing the oral pathogens, E. coli, bacterial cytolethal distending toxin, and herpes type one, and uh, why it's important to detect some of these cross reactivities. Because we do not work today or walk today or sleep tonight and we wake up tomorrow with dementia or Alzheimer's disease. From normal to abnormal sometimes takes many, many years. So it takes years to get from normal to early Alzheimer's. So 20 years or more before diagnosis. So 46.7 million in America, they're in preclinical Alzheimer's, but they do not have obvious symptoms. Two and a half million, they have mild cognitive impairment, which can get better with Dr. Bredesen's methodologies. And finally, three and a half million with dementia. So ladies and gentlemen, we should not wait until 46.7 million to end up either with mild cognitive impairment or with dementia. If we detect the environmental triggers, we change our lifestyle, all the above can prevent individual to move from normal to preclinical stage from preclinical stage to mild cognitive impairment and from mild cognitive impairment to full-blown dementia. So this is the panel that Alzheimer's links that Dr. White was talking about. It's not about cross-reactivity uh, just with pathogens, cross-reactivity with foods such as casein and gliding toxic peptides. The, we test for blood-brain barriers, we test for gut barriers, and we test for uh, proteins involved in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, and also the nerve growth factors as well. And also, let's not to forget the enteric nerve, uh, which is major component of this panel. So I highly recommend to do this test and uh, if any abnormalities, then you remove uh, some of these cross-reactive foods and uh, hopefully by that, you'll stop progression of Alzheimer's from the first stage to the second and third and fourth. So here, an article Alzheimer, from Alzheimer's and Dementia forecasting the prevalence of preclinical and clinical Alzheimer's disease in the United States. The diagnosis of persons with preclinical disease is potentially important because persons may be more likely to benefit from disease-modifying treatments 
such as the one Dr. Bredesen is doing, such as the one my son Elroy is doing. If interventions occur before the occurrence of significant brain damage. So doctors can help you before significant damage is done to the brain. That's the message of this article. So now let's go to additional pathogens. So pathogens in general, pathogens associated immune reactivity screen, bacteria, viruses, parasites, molds, yeast, spirochetes, all of these have a component, antigens, which cross-react with human tissue. That's why I emphasized in the beginning the issue of what, the, the, what viruses are doing in order to hide from the immune system. The same thing, bacteria, parasites, spirochetes, and yeast are doing in order to hide from the immune system. They have a component which is similar to human tissue, including brain, the brain. So that's why Cyrex is offering these 29 different antibody against 25, uh, for 28 different antigens. And if you have any elevation of antibodies against some of these pathogens, then the doctor will help you to treat and reverse the course of uh, autoimmune diseases. And, and in particular, I would like to draw your attention to the three molds in here. I know most of you when you have patients with mold exposure, you do not measure the most important lab test, which is measuring antibodies against the mold antigens itself. Aspergillus, penicillium, and stachybotrys, which is part of this panel. What most of you, most of you do, going measuring Mycotoxins in the urine, which nobody knows where really they are coming from. Are they from the food? Are they from the bacteria? Are they from the viruses in the gut? No, nobody really knows. But when you make antibodies against the Aspergillus, Penicillium, Stachybotrys, that shows that you live in the moldy environment the mold releases the antigens, get into your body, and you make antibody against them. So please, ladies and gentlemen, do not waste your money on uh, useless testing such as... Uh, urine mycotoxin. Urine mycotoxin, which is not a reliable method. Uh, maybe it's important as for some other uh, environmental factors, but they are not meant to measure exposure to molds, aspergillus, penicillium, and stachybotrys. Thank you so much. So I made my point. Now, <laughs> let's have some fun. You see this beautiful slide, very simple, right? So far in the literature, Epstein-Barr virus, was the queen of autoimmunity. For years, the scientists, the autoimmunologists were discussing and claiming that we should find a vaccine against EBV because EBV is responsible for 20 different autoimmune diseases, including lupus and multiple sclerosis. This was tr true and it still is true. But HHV6 came along, she started saying that I am the queen of autoimmunity. And believe me, I'll show you some data that it is true that HHV6 is so far the queen of autoimmunity more than EBV. 
But that was true until a year ago, 10 months ago, who SARS-CoV-2 was discovered. So when there is conversation, there is a, by the way, a comic that Joel and I, we are putting together, hopefully we'll be able to finish it soon. Next year or next time I'll present it to you. So there is conversation between EBV, HHV6, and SARS-CoV-2. Who is the real queen of autoimmunity? So after back and forth, SARS-CoV-2 saying that I am the queen of autoimmunity. If you don't believe me, look at my structure. If you don't believe me, then why they call me Corona? Meaning I have many crowns on my surfaces. So believe me, you'll see some data that I'm presenting to you that after, yes, EBV was the first one, HHV6 the second one, but now number one queen of autoimmunity is SARS-CoV-2. So I'm going to share with you. That, Dr. Vastani, does it yes. really make any sense to, to um, give people a vaccine against EBV to prevent autoimmunity when isn't it quite likely that the same uh, immunoreactivity that occurs from the virus is likely to occur from the vaccine? Absolutely. Let's, let's get to last, last part of, last sentence of my talk tonight will be exactly about that. So here, test results of a patient 58 years old lady, went to 10 different doctors and had a pile of laboratory test results, including urine mycotoxin. Honestly, none of them could help her. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. Until one of the doctors sent the request for viral panel, and Lyme disease from Immunosciences Lab, which is our specialty. When I got the results, look at some of the abnormalities. HSV1 and 2 IgM, red, highly positive, compared to the highest normal range. EBV early antigen, very high meaning EBV reactivation, EBV nuclear antigen IgM, highly elevated, CMV IgM, elevated, measles IgM, can you believe it? One probably in 100 tests that we do, measles IgM is positive. But look at this, three times of the reference range, Then when I looked at HHV6 results, very high level of HHV6 IgM. Then next slide, when we looked at Lyme disease, six different antigens from Borrelia elevated antibody against that. Four different subspecies are elevated, three different Co-infections, Babesia, Ehrlichia, and Bartonella elevated. So what's happening in here? The patient is having Lyme disease, herpes infection, EBV infection, cytomegalovirus infection, measles, ongoing measles infection, and HHV6. What do you think? Which one is the right diagnosis in here? And by the way, it is a requirement by Department of Health. If measles IgM is elevated and Borrelia IgM is elevated, we have to report that to Department of Health. So think about the laboratory who do not have an immunologist like me. 
They are going to report this to Department of Health saying that we have patient with measles. So what I did, I called the doctor. I said, doctor, please tell me if your patient is having any symptoms of ongoing measles infection. I was told no, absolutely not. So then I came to conclusion, actually, it is reaction to HHV6, an IgM antibody produced against HHV6, cross-react with measles, with CMV, with EBV, and HSV1 and 2. And I told the doctor, if you treat your patient for HHV6, all these antibodies will disappear probably in three months. And I hope that's the case. This is ongoing right now. So that's very important. It is very important to use a laboratory with an individual who is able to interpret the test results for you the way that can help the patient and can help the doctor as well. Because imagine that Department of Health are busy with COVID. Now we are going to overwhelm them with measles and Lyme infection unjustified. So I wanted to share with you that case. So now let's go to the COVID, the queen of autoimmunity. So between March and April 2020, upon the availability of blood tests for SARS-CoV-2, we took first five and later additional blood specimens that had been confirmed positive for COVID-19 and tested them for biomarkers of autoimmunity, ANA, ENA, double-stranded DNA, actin, mitochondrial antibody, rheumatoid factor, and immune complexes. Elroy and I were very surprised to find out that three of the five initial specimens had significant elevation in the biomarkers of autoimmunity. Usually we find this in one in 20, one in 50, but here three out of five. So these, these results, I would like to show you how you know, the brain of researchers work. So these promoted us to investigate patterns of cross-reactivity between SARS-CoV-2 and autoimmune target proteins. Now, when we review the literature so far during 2020, at least 10 different groups published articles about anti-nuclear antibody in COVID, lupus anticoagulant, ENA, cardiolipin, uh, our work, ANA, ENA, actin, mitochondrial antibody, anti-interferon, anti-MDA5 antibody, myelin basic protein antibody, NMDA receptor antibody, and more. These are all in COVID patients. So upon availability of mouse and rabbit monoclonal antibodies made against spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 and nucleoprotein, we took those antibodies made specifically against SARS-CoV-2 antigens and applied them to 50 different tissue antigens. And we found that those antibodies reacted with mitochondria, with ENA, anti-nuclear an antigens, 
actin, actomyosin, tropomyosin, collagen, thyroid peroxidase, brain growth factors and brain antigens, blood brain barrier proteins, MBP, myelin basic protein in the brain, transglutaminases in skin, in the gut, and tight junction proteins, occludin, zonulin, cloudin, also found in epithelial cell tight junctions of the lungs. So compare that to reaction of monoclonal antibody to SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, which is 100%, look at transglutaminase 3. Look at extractable nuclear antigen, mitochondria. So SARS-CoV-2 cross-react with many human tissue antigens, and no one can deny this fact. Also, we took anti-nucleoprotein antibodies and reacted to those 50 human tissue antigens. Look at mitochondria as if this is nucleoprotein or SARS-CoV-2. Again, ENA, ANA, actin, actomyosin, thyroid peroxidase, thyroglobulin, transglutaminase 6, myelin basic protein, other antigens as well. So let me go back to this and then uh, I'll share with you another piece of the story. So when we send this for publication to clinical immunology, within 24 hours, you know, at, the, you know, at that time around May, was accepted for publication. In clinical immunology, it was online 24 or 48 hours later, but it was published in August 2020 officially. When this article was published, some of my colleagues were saying that the antibody that used are made in mouse or, and rabbit. These are not kind of antibodies that are humanized antibodies that are used or will be used for treatment of patients with COVID. Why don't you do the same study with human monoclonal antibodies? Okay, I said, thank you so much, but those are not available. So while I was thinking about this <laughs> on July 7. I got exposed to SARS-CoV-2. Two weeks later, I, ha I had to be hospitalized. Elroy took me to the hospital. And you see, a couple days later, my CRP, 156, my ferritin. But thanks to the treatment at Cedars, four days later, I got released from the hospital and by July 29 and August, everything is back to normal. What treatment did you receive? Uh, remdesivir and dexamethasone. Okay. Okay, now, I really don't know. You see the knee, right? For almost 90 days post COVID, I was suffering from knee pain and knee inflammation. Was that because of the medication or because of COVID? And again, I would like to share with you that in my family, my mother suffered from rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis for 47 years and she passed away from the disease. So that's my, the weak part of my body. So is it because of COVID or because of the medication? I really don't know. Okay, so 
This experience made me more serious to further investigate cross-reactivity between SARS-CoV-2 with human tissue using monoclonal antibodies, human monoclonal antibodies. So what is human monoclonal antibody? The polyclonal antibody, let's say we inject something to a rabbit, many clones from spleen or lymph nodes, they are going to make that different type of antibodies. The antibodies made by different clones, that's why they call them polyclonal antibodies. If we inject that to human, that will develop some kind of sickness. We cannot do that. Maybe once is good, but if you repeat that, the individual will develop serum sickness or something like that. Monoclonal antibody is an antibody is made by a clone of cells. But many, very recently, they found that if we take an individual, human lymphocytes, from individual infected with a virus, and by the way, this is the memory lymphocyte, okay? And we take that memory lymphocyte who knows how to produce antibody, IgG antibody against SARS-CoV-2, that lymphocyte becomes activated and, and ready to produce antibodies. There is a method in the clinical labs or research labs called immortalization of B cells. For example, if you add Epstein-Barr virus, Epstein-Barr virus is going to activate the B cells to divide like crazy and make antibodies. So they add all kinds of reagent and, you know, these cells become immortalized. But if we take these, one of these cells or some of these cells, okay, which became activated, they know how to produce antibodies against SARS-CoV-2, fuse them with human myeloma cell. Human myeloma cell is a factory for production of proteins, in this case, antibody. So that's why you see half of this cell, it's called human hybridoma. Half of it is from myeloma. The other half is from B cell. And then when D cell, hybridoma cell make antibodies, we call that human monoclonal antibodies. We can inject them safely to human without having any side effect. So that was important to explain to you. So when monoclonal, human monoclonal antibody became available around August 2020, immediately we purchased those antibodies. And we repeated that experiment that I explained before. And we reacted at this time with 55 different tissue antigens, 28 of them reacted from moderate to strongly. And by the way, whatever I'm going to explain to you from and on is published in Frontiers in Immunology, very prestigious journal, eight days ago. And if you look at the journal right now, we had more than 20,000 views, which is unheard of in this journal. That shows how much people and scientists are interested about possible cross-reactivity between SARS-CoV-2 and human tissue and its implication for autoimmune diseases. So here the results, they're almost similar to what I showed you. So this is nice because not only polyclonal antibody 
reacted with human tissue. Now monoclonal antibody made against spike protein reacted almost with the same antigens, okay? Actin, mitochondria, ENA, ANA, histone, brain antigens, collagens, alpha myosins, thyroid peroxidase, liver, GAT65, transglutaminases, and tight junction proteins. Also, we used human monoclonal antibody made against nucleoprotein. The results, again, identical with some variation, but very similar. Look at mitochondria. Almost, I would say, 60% reaction of monoclonal antibody to nucleoprotein, which is in red. Two items, mitochondria and insulin receptor, reacted very, very strongly. Acrylin, zonulin, which are tight junction proteins, which are measuring antibodies, part of RA2, cross-reacting strongly with SARS-CoV-2 proteins. So brain, alpha-myosin, liver, GAT65, and tight junction proteins are cross-reacting with SARS-CoV-2 nucleoprotein. In order to show specificity of this antigen antibody reaction, meaning monoclonal antibody reaction to specific antigen, when you do serial dilution, like what we did in here from one to 200 to one to 25,600, you should see decline in the level of the antibody. And that's the case. Also, we did inhibition study. And again, in proportion to the amount of antigen put in competition, we see decline in the antigen antibody reaction. All of that support that the reaction that we detected between monoclonal antibodies made against SARS-CoV-2 spike and nucleoprotein with human tissue antigens is very specific. So when we send this for publication, the reviewers from the journal asked us to do epitope mapping. What is epitope mapping? Another meaning, compare peptides from human tissue to SARS-CoV-2 and see if their fingerprint is similar to each other. If that's the case, then proves that our experiments are 100% correct. So we did that. And they asked us to do it with mitochondria. And we found 30 different peptides from mitochondria that had more than 50% identity or similarity with spike protein, but less with nucleoprotein. I'm showing only two peptides. So in order to clarify this for you, ladies and gentlemen, you need only five of these red amino acids to be similar between mitochondria and spike protein in order to cross-react with each other, meaning antibody against mitochondria will react with spike, Antibody made against spike will react with mitochondria. And here we have eight of them. And we had cases even we had more than that. So that's about mitochondria. How about actin? The same thing about actin. We found between 20 to 30 proteins for peptides who cross-reacted with spike protein. And finally, they asked us to do it with 
thyroid peroxidase. Again, we see significant cross-reactivity between TPO and spike protein. What does that mean? Patient with COVID may develop thyroid autoimmunity in the future, or even some individuals get vaccinated, may have cross-reactive antibodies against TPO. Time will tell, we don't know. I cannot really ask, answer that question, but I'm just asking that question. So we proved that concept of cross-reactivity. It is real. Antibody made against spike protein and nucleoprotein react with cellular components such as mitochondria, with liver, muscle, joints, thyroid, nervous system, skin, GI and tight junctions, and some other antigens that I'm not mentioning in here. So if, if that is the case, okay, are we the only one? No, I already shared with you earlier that there are at least 10 different groups who showed autoantibodies in patients with SARS-CoV-2. Not only autoantibodies on, on the top right here, also look at diseases detected in patients with SARS-CoV-2, type 1 diabetes and uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, vasculitis, and many other autoimmune diseases. By the way, the credit for this slide is going to uh, Professor Schoenfeld's laboratory who presented this in uh, Mosaic of Autoimmunity about uh, a month ago. So we are not the only one claiming that there is cross-reactivity between SARS-CoV-2 and human tissue. So molecular mimicry between SARS-CoV-2 spike glycoprotein and mammalian proteomes implication for the vaccine. And this was published by professor from Italy by the, uh, the name of Kanduk with Yehuda Schoenfeld. And another article by Schoenfeld Group by Gilad Halpert, SARS-CoV-2, the autoimmune virus. And then I did not put additional slides that by scientists from the US, uh, Lyons Weiler, um, Dr. Professor Ernfeld, also from Israel. Uh, professor from Germany. Frank. Her name Frank. is... Uh, Frank. Yeah, Dr. Frank, or Professor Frank, who published a very elegant, I'll show you the slide later on, an article there recently. So I am not alone. We are not alone. At least 10 to 15 different groups in the world published about SARS-CoV-2 and autoimmunity and cross-reactivity, and even showed epitope mapping similarities between SARS-CoV-2 and human tissue. So what, what is the meaning of cross-reactivity? So in th this very simple slide, we get infected with a virus, or we get injected with the vaccine. Our plasma cells are going to produce antibody to SARS-CoV-2 or to the vaccine antigen. These antibodies are going to bind to the receptor on the virus and neutralizing the virus and the virus will not be able to bind to ACE receptor. That's the goal. But unfortunately, due to cross reactivity, some of these antibodies may bind to different human tissue antigens and cause autoimmunity 
five years down the road, 10 years down the road, a year down the road due to mimicry. So remember this very simple slide. Our goal is to make neutralizing antibodies to neutralize the virus, but unfortunately some of those antibodies act like friendly fire causing autoimmune reactivity at this level I'm calling it, not autoimmune disease. Um, can I just throw in a question right here? Dr. Abara had asked, um, after someone gets infected, do they get um, just IgG antibodies or do, do they have neutralizing antibodies? There's been a big controversy you know, in the popular press that, or, or the doctors who come on TV who say, well, you may have antibodies, but if they're not neutralizing antibodies, then they're not going to be protected. I'm sorry, again, they are not immunologists. <laughs> Okay, I don't call them experts. You make antibodies, your body is making neutralizing antibodies. So there's, there's no situation where they make antibodies that are not neutralizing? I don't think so. Does Maybe it, you make, it, you make anti, let's say if you make 100 units of antibodies, at least 50% of those are neutralizing antibodies. Does it matter how severe an infection someone has? Like if somebody has a more severe infection, do they get more protection or more antibodies versus somebody who has a mild infection? Uh, really, we don't have the answer for that. Okay. Yeah, okay, so let's continue. And I'm very close to uh, finishing my talk in about 10 minutes. So after this introduction, look at this very simple slide. Immunity from the virus, like the one I had, or from the vaccine. We know antibody against the virus cross-react with human tissue. We know antibody made against component of the virus, which is the spike protein, also cross-react with human tissue. So what will be the future consequences? Time will tell. However, let's go ahead and look at this slide. We know that when we make IgG, IgM antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, they disappear after 30 days, in some people earlier even than that. But these antibodies, unfortunately, appear in the body with additional autoantibodies, antinuclear antibodies, rheumatoid factor, phospholipid, interferon gamma antibodies, MDA5 antibodies, myelin basic protein antibodies, tight junction protein antibodies, all of that. So we know there is some consequence of autoimmunity due to viral infection. So we should not vaccinate the public and let them develop the disease. Some of them will die and some of them may develop autoimmune disease. But we are lucky that these antibodies are shorter because if those antibodies will stay in the body for a long time, from autoimmune reactivity may end with autoimmune disease. So that's one side of the coin. The other side, we vaccinate. We make circulating IgG and IgM antibody against spike protein. Our goal is to repeat the vaccine and make enough antibodies to stay in our body for a long term. But the question I'm going to ask, what will be the consequence of these long-term or presence of these long-term antibodies made against spike protein that cross-react with human tissue? Again, the answer, time will tell. So, I just wanted to share with you this article by 
Dr. Frank from Germany. Look at the title, just published very recently. I think at end of December. High frequency of cerebrospinal fluid autoantibodies in COVID-19 patients with neurological symptoms. So what they did from very severe ill patients, removed serum and spinal fluid. Majority of these patients unfortunately died. They reacted them with myelin basic protein and tissue antigens, you will see the results, and they reacted with many, many sections of mouse brain cells, which is identical to human brain cells. And also they detected antibodies in blood against myelin basic protein and NMDA receptor. So autoantibodies may already now explain some aspects of multi-organ disease in COVID-19 and can guide immunotherapy in selected cases. So here, clear picture when they took spinal fluid from COVID patients and added them to brain cells, you see that fluorescence indicate reaction of those antibodies in spinal fluid with brain cell antigens, in this case, vessels in the brain, Purkinje cells, neurons in the brain, and many other components of the brain. This is very elegant study, proves the concept of cross-reactivity and autoimmunity against the brain due to COVID. The article was so important that Dr. Cry in uh, Nature Reviews Immunology wrote this commentary. In summary, cross-reactive antibodies generated in response to SARS-CoV-2 may contribute to some of the clinical phenotypes seen in COVID-19 and could provide a mechanistic explanation for the persistence of symptoms in patients who have recovered from initial viral infections. Finally, although preliminary, these findings suggest that monitoring for self-reactive antibodies and post-challenge autoimmunity should be incorporated into vaccination trials. And with that, before recommending type of testing, and I would like to read this, the final couple sentences. And I would like all of you to remember that Aristo Vojdani on the January 28, 2021, said the following, while I am not against vaccination, I am worried about the rise of autoimmunity post-COVID vaccination, okay? Until the time will tell, please consider to test your patients for possible autoimmune reactivity, not autoimmune disease, autoimmune reactivity as part of their yearly checkup. And with your permission, I'm going to read this because history will judge me in the future. While I'm not against vaccination, I'm worried about the rise of autoimmunity post-COVID vaccination. Until the time will tell, as I mentioned in my slides, please consider to test your patients for possible autoimmune reactivity as part of their yearly checkup. How to do that? By considering Array 5 uh, multiple autoimmune reactivity screen from Cyrex or 
simple autoimmune panel from Immuno Sciences Lab. And I'm not really selfish in here. You can use any laboratory you want to do anti-nuclear antibody, rheumatoid factor, immune complexes, actin and mitochondrial antibodies, which you saw the evidence of cross-reactivity with SARS-CoV-2 antigens. Thank you. So uh, we got a bunch of questions here. One of the questions is, is there cross-reactivity between flu vaccine and COVID? The answer is yes. There are lots of publications who show that memory lymphocytes, memory lymphocytes taken from patients with flu vaccine who had flu vaccine before, put them in culture with COVID antigens, those memory lymphocytes immediately started reacting to COVID antigen. And so therefore that's the best indication of cross reactivity between flu and SARS-CoV-2. But we can go on, on online NIH BLAST and look for structural similarity and believe me, it does exist. But this uh, is the most elegant way of to show first, memory lymphocytes stay in the body. And also you can demonstrate evidence of cross reactivity. By the way, is there, is there a way to test for memory B cells or memory T cells? Yes. How? You just put them in culture with what antigen you think the memory T cells and B cells for SARS-CoV-2? Yes. Okay. So if you have a patient where you are not sure the antibody is negative, but you think the patient had SARS-CoV-2 or COVID. Okay. You can take blood from that patient, put them separate, the white blood cells, put them in culture with COVID specific antigen and incubate that in incubator at 37 degrees for 48 hours. And then you look at fingerprint of cytokine production, interferon gamma. Even you can wait for a few days and check for antibody production. So yes, that it is possible. There are methodologies and it is possible to do that. Right, but there aren't any labs available right now. That no, are no, no. Okay. No. Only for uh, research. So, uh, Dr. Rabar asked another question. What is the mechanism of persistent IgM in chronic Lyme? I think most of the cr chronic Lyme is due to cross-reactivity that we call it chronic Lyme. And what? I showed you, but, but, but okay. I'll, I'll answer that question. And Because we have memory lymphocytes, right? Dr. Abba and Dr. Ben. If my memory lymphocytes made against EBV, and I did publish an article that EBV cross reacts with Borrelia burgdorferi, agent of Lyme disease. So now imagine I have memory lymphocytes for Epstein-Barr virus or vice versa. I have memory lymphocytes for Lyme and these memory lymphocytes can cross with each other. So I can get my memory lymphocytes could be exposed to EBV antigen and produce antibodies against Borrelia burgdorferi or release cytokines. And that's why I'm really against 
the method that, first of all, I published about it about 10, 12 years ago, that you can culture lymphocytes with Borrelia antigen and look for cytokine production. So now there is a method called ELISE part. Instead of measuring the level of cytokines, you look at the spot formation. And they call, if that spot is positive, this is the lab in Germany, and you say, they say you have Lyme disease. But I argue with that. You could have also memory lymphocytes made against EBV. You expose it in culture with Lyme antigen. Now they produce the same cytokines and will give you positive spot. And you tell the doctors that your patient is having chronic Lyme. So chronic Lyme could be due to cross-reactive memory B cell, which can make cross-reactive antibodies. So if um, somebody chose to get a, a um, COVID vaccination to protect themselves, um, what we know so far about the two vaccines that are available, the Pfizer and the uh, Moderna, and soon we'll have the, uh, we'll have the Johnson & Johnson and... Um, and with a different mechanism of action is if you were to just speculate, would you think one of them would be more or less likely to lead to possible um, autoimmunity or immunoreactivity in, uh, you know, uh, somebody who just happens to be vulnerable to that? First of all, we are right now in the dark. That's why I emphasize time will tell. All of them, they're using, I think, the same, almost the same RNA. RNA for spike protein. Well, I think the first... Even if they use, even if they use RNA for another protein, nuclear protein. And if you read my article, by the way, that we use two other antigens as well. Those other two antigens, the membrane and the nucleocapsid, well, the, the two more antigens, it's in the article in Frontiers in Immunology. Also cross-reacted with many tissue. So the world of cross-reactivity is not limited only to spike protein. It, it is also applies to other antigens of SARS-CoV-2. That's why I called the COVID or SARS-CoV-2, the queen of autoimmunity after EBV and HHV6. Right. I, I don't know a lot about this, but I, um, I believe um, that the um, AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson um, have a slightly different mechanism than the Pfizer and the Moderna, and they use an adenovirus uh, as part of um, uh, how they provide protection rather than uh, a strand of messenger RNA. Yeah, it doesn't matter, honestly. What is the goal? The goal of vaccine is the patient or the individual will produce antibodies that if in the future will be exposed to the virus, will have enough neutralizing antibodies to neutralize the action of the virus. That's the goal. Now, really, we don't know any of these viruses that were injected, the patients made antibodies, how much antibodies they made, how much neutralizing antibody they made, we are going to learn more in the future. That's why I said I'm not against vaccination. The vaccines right now saving lives because if not, they will get the disease like I got, and not everybody is lucky like me, who I survived, but many people died from the disease. So I'm not, again, against the vaccine, but we should learn more about mechanism of action of the vaccine and whether or not these cross-reactive antibodies that our body is going to generate, is it going to protect us? or is going to damage our tissue. And again, time will tell.
are you going to consider getting a vaccine in six months? Because I got the disease, no. Okay. Um, uh, somebody asked about patients who already have, say, elevated antiphospholipid antibodies. Um, are they more at risk for, um, you know, immunoreactivity immuno if they either get sick or get a vaccine? Okay, uh, I have many relatives. Unfortunately, some of them have autoimmune disease. They called me and they wanted my advice. And this is my advice to my own family. I'm sorry, I don't want to generalize this. Okay, I told them if you have an autoimmune disease, please wait at least six months, let's see what, what will be the results of vaccinations and then consider vaccination. For somebody who's sick, um, as part of their treatment, um, would you think that uh, monoclonal antibodies or convalescent plasma therapy, meaning taking um, antibodies, say, from somebody like you, um, would, would one of those more likely be effective and or safer? I know they're using lots of monoclonal antibodies and from patients who had the disease. The latest article about a week ago I read was that when they take plasma from a person like me, of course, now I don't have the antibody anymore. Let's say two weeks after I released from the hospital, it doesn't work. It didn't work. Okay. Um, but again, this is only one study that I read. Yeah, somebody asked the same thing. Um, let's see. Um, same question. Um, why are some people asymptomatic if there is so much cross-reactivity? I think that just depends on a person, right? Um, do you have an opinion as to the efficacy of the PCR test for um, viral? Unfortunately, many false positives, many more false positives than false negatives. Also, the antibodies, I had experience with our employees in here that some of them were tested in two different labs. You know, we, we let them go for... 14 days and we wanted them to be negative, right? And they were tested again and again and again. One lab negative, the other lab positive. So what do you do? Tell him stay home again. And so unfortunately it turned out one of the labs was reporting many, many false positive results for antibody think, and antigen I, even. I think the latest guidelines from the CDC are that after you test positive, after 10 days, you can return to work if you don't have symptoms. Yeah. And they recommend not testing again because it's not unusual for people to test positive for two or Yeah, three so hours. because at my work, uh, we have one person who did not develop the disease and we, wanted, we did not want to put him in danger. So we told the person, until you bring the evidence of negativity, you cannot come back to work. Right. Um, people ask, is it being recorded? Yes, it'll be included in my weekly podcast. I'll post it sometime next week. You can listen to it on Apple Podcasts and there'll be a video version on YouTube. Um, autoimmune disease. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. Why did ferrets die after exposure to coronavirus after vaccination? Are you concerned about this? Again, again, can you repeat? Um, I, this is referring to animals. Um, why did ferrets, I guess these are these furry animals, I, 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 apparently they died after exposure to coronavirus after getting vaccinated. I'm not aware of that, I'm sorry. Okay. If the person can educate us, I'll be very happy to <laughs> yeah. learn Dr. from. Dr. Lalazar, are you, are you still on the call? Did you want to unmute yourself and ask the question again? Maybe she's not. Um, 
Let's see. What do you think about the recent paper in Nature Immunology that suggests in cases of severe COVID, long-term antibody-mediated immunity to to the virus has been shown to be absent? Um, Cardiovascular 19 uh, or or COVID-19 disease can yield development of new autoimmunity. The messenger RNA vaccines may confer protection against both effects. Well, first of all, the first part is, uh, yes, I agree that the antibody disappeared. Uh, my antibody disappeared after 60 days. Right. But and the it second doesn't, part doesn't matter is, if it's severe or not severe. Yeah. The second part was about autoimmunity, uh, cardiovascular, what I didn't understand. Um, I, I'm sorry. I, I think I said it wrong. I, I was saying cardiovascular. I think he just abbreviated COVID-19 can yield development of new autoimmunity. We know that. I think the point he's trying to make is, does the messenger RNA vaccine protect against the autoimmunity? And I think you've answered that question. Again, time will tell. I don't know if these antibodies that right now people are producing, they are protective or pathogenic. Time will tell. Uh, They are protective against the virus, but against autoimmunity, we don't know. Okay, so the virus is mutating. Um, Do we think it's likely that um, somebody like yourself who has um, protection against the uh, SARS-CoV-2, um, would you still have protection against um, these uh, mutated forms? And, and the same question related to vaccination. Yes, thank you. I believe that I will have 99.9% protection. That sounds and pretty the best good to protection me. protection is when you get sick right. and you have memory T cells in your body that stays forever. Right. So, uh, um, curious if you got the flu shot, is this the reason you got so sick because you did not? No, I am. I never got flu shot. And, uh, because again, I believe in cross reactivity and autoimmunity because of my family history of autoimmunity. I never considered Flu shots, I believe in my muco- strength of my mucosal immune system, how to keep my mucosal immune system, my first line of defense, strong in order to keep me safe against viruses. But unfortunately, that was enough against SARS-CoV-2. Is there a, is there a big benefit to doing antibody testing? And if so, when's the best time to do it? Antibody testing against what? You, let's say um, you uh, contracted the virus afterwards. Is is there a benefit to testing your antibodies? Does it really matter? Well, if, if they disappear after two, three months, I don't think so. It does matter. Okay, but... But, is, but is if it, you get vaccinated... Right. And you have long lasting antibodies. I will test as I recommended. I will test for possible autoimmune reactivity once a year in order to make sure an individual with family history of autoimmunity are not going to develop an autoimmune disease. Right. Um, I don't really understand this question. Um... JL asked, uh, why are some patients asymptomatic? I think that's just people have different reactions to any disease, right? Okay, the answer is that really it's uh, the inoculum or the number of viruses that we get get into our body also plays a role. And also, the, we each one of us, we have different number of receptors and our Epithelial cells or like other types of ACE2 cells. Two receptors, which is the way yes, the virus gains entry. So, so that that's really is another factor. So, and more number of viruses attacking you at the same time, you get more sick than the one who less uh, viruses are attacking. And we know the uh, level of vitamin D. It plays a big role in how likely you are to get sick. The status of your immune system. Absolutely. Vitamin D is because strengthening our immune system. 
Absolutely. It regulates your T-Rex cells. You know that. Absolutely. And of course, we know about the benefits of vitamin C and zinc and quercetin yeah. and melatonin. Right, right, um, right. So, um, so if we've been infected, it's, it's the same question again. If you've been infected, are you permanently protected? Most likely. Yes, I believe I said 99.9%. Let's say 99%. I believe I'm protected. And uh, all these claims that even if you are had the disease, even if you have been vaccinated, there is some information on the internet. Still, you have to wear a mask. Still, you have to do all steps required by law. Um, this question is, let's say um, you recovered from SARS COVID-2, you get the autoimmune screen and you have autoimmune reactivity. What do you do to prevent yourself from getting an autoimmune disease? There is a lot you could do. You know, you find what are the triggers, remove the triggers and you, you reverse or stop the right. course of autoimmune disease. That's really my, you know, I wrote that in my book in relation to food. Hopefully one day I will have time to finish the other two books, one about toxic chemicals, the other about pathogens. But unfortunately this year I became busy with SARS-CoV-2 and research and all of that. Right. I could not finish my second book. Well, I, I think the answer is from a functional medicine approach, there's usually not just one trigger for an autoimmune disease. So even though you may have reactivity from SARS-CoV-2, uh, there are likely going to be other triggers. You may have toxins. You may have food sensitivities. Oral pathogens. You wanna, yes, you want to clear all those out, reduce your overall level of immune reactivity. And then even if you have uh, some reactivity to a virus, you're less likely to develop the full disease. And this will be the last question. Um, what is happening in the brain post-vaccination when people get a memory loss, brain fog? Um, is that a guaranteed blood-brain barrier breach and autoimmunity, or could it be some other mechanism? I, I think the article by uh, Dr. Frank, uh, which I highly recommend to read, is very clear that the autoantibody, the antibodies made against SARS-CoV-2 uh, attacking uh, um, different components of the brain and causing damage to the neurons. Okay, um, excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for your valuable you. time. I know you actually have another presentation you have to yes. do. So. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you, you so much, Dr. Bajstani. So awesome.